If you take your Bibles and open to the book of 1 John, chapter 1, we uh, started 1 John last week and looked at God's introduction to the book uh, through the experience of John witnessing and hearing from the Messiah and the power of that eyewitness testimony of living with, eating with, and understanding the teaching of our Lord and Savior. So we're going to continue uh, with the message from the book of First John, and he says this in verse 5 of chapter 1. Now this is the message we have heard, heard from him and declared to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, Yet we walk in the darkness, or walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing to you so that you may not sin. I'm I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not all, not our, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. We'll pause there in our reading for this morning. By the way, I just want you to know, babies crying never bother me because the, psalm, the psalmist said that out of the mouth of babes he has perfected praise. So God is being praised and we rejoice in the noise. Sometimes it gives us a headache, but we still rejoice in the noise. It is from the Lord, and it is a blessing. Now, he says here that, um, so he just finished with an explanation of what we've heard, what we've seen it was from the beginning, we've seen it with our eyes, we've observed, we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And he's speaking of the Messiah and this testimony, the testimony that he gives of, of, from the Lord's teaching. And he says, this is the message we have heard from him. And we declare to you, so the message that you're hearing right now through the book of John, yes, God inspired John to write this through the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that to be true according to Scripture. Right, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for, peru- for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So we believe that it, is ca- that it came from God. But here we have John specifically referencing that this message is something he heard directly from the Messiah himself while he was alive on this earth. You say, well, how do you know that? Because he just said that what he's going to tell you he heard in Saul. So this message is something he heard from the Messiah and he's, and he's declaring it to you and the message is simple. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. We see this in John verse, in chapter 8 verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. Jesus said this in John chapter 12, verse 44. He said, The one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that, uh, so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't accept my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. 
For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. I know that his command is eternal life. So the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So what does he say? He says, God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him at all. This has been the way from the beginning. According to John 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. God has always been the light. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. Jesus said this in John 3, verse 19. He said, This then is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. You see, the Lord through John here is making a very clear distinction between light and darkness. Where light exists, is there any darkness? Go like this, no. Where there's light, you can see. Where there is no light, you cannot see. You ever been in a place where it's so dark that you put your hand in front, you can't see your hand. I mean, that's really creepy, isn't it? That, that is the absence of any light. The absence of any light at all is, if I move, I could easily smash my toe, my knee, or my face. Because I have no idea what's in front of me. Right? So you, you get in total darkness, and, and you walk kind of like this. Right? Right? Isn't that how it works? Right? Because you're like, okay, I got to feel. I don't want to smash into anything. I'm, I'm taking slow, careful steps. I'm testing it out here. And I got to keep something in front of my head in case I smash my face. I don't want to smash it, right? You see, so light and dark do not go together. And I love this comparison that God's making here because what is the light that comes from God? You say, well, Steve, is it we get daylight? Well, yes, that's what he created. But the light he's talking about here is not a physical light that you see with your eyes. It's a spiritual light understood by faith. You say, well, how do you know that? It says because uh, if we... Um, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is not the kind of light that is just, oh, I see it, and so I can walk around. No, this is spiritual light known through having your sins forgiven. So then what does this light look like? Well, let's put it, this, God's trying to make it really simple for us. So let's keep it simple, all right? God's truth equals light, all right? Anybody here like math? I love math. It's really great. All right? It's cut and dry. Um, so, God's truth equals light, or light equals God's truth. It goes either way, right? So then, the opposite of God's truth would be what? 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 Okay, lies, right? So lies then would equal darkness. Okay? So we have truth and light, lies and darkness. Guess what? They don't go together. You see, in this description that God's giving here, there is no gray area in the middle. 
Now, in life and in understanding how God wants us to live, there are some things that they feel kind of gray, okay? And frankly, the Lord addresses a little bit of that in Romans 14 when he talks about uh, some people believe they can eat meat. Others say, no, you can't eat that meat. Some people say they should celebrate a certain day. Others say, don't celebrate any day. Uh, you know what God's point in that is? We should love each other in spite of our different opinions. So there's, a, there's some gray area in, in how we choose to live out our understanding of God's truth. But God's truth is not gray. God's truth is light. The opposite of God's truth is lies and it's darkness. And so God wants us to understand that this is so clear, it's impossible to say, I have fellowship with the light. I have fellowship with the truth. But in this one area of my life, it's inconvenient and I want to be in the darkness. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Right? Jesus himself said, he said, you cannot serve two masters. For you will either love one and, and, and reject the other or cling to one and despise the other. So we cannot, have, we cannot say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness. If we do so, we are lying and not practicing the truth. Says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, of Je Jesus' his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to go back to John 3, and I want you to understand something, what he's saying here about having fellowship with him and with each other. John 3, he says this, he says, verse 21, but anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God, which is opposed to people who reject the light because they, they, they practice wicked things, they hate the light, and they don't want their deeds exposed. So here's how simple this is. When I know God's truth, and I know that I have no ability to earn the right to walk in his truth. I come through the blood of Jesus, correct? Go like this, yes. I come through the blood of Jesus into his truth, accepting his truth, walking in his light. When I do so, my sin has been exposed for what it really is. My sin is what put my Messiah on the cross. My sin has been exposed as ugly and nasty and horrible and needing a, an unbelievable level of forgiveness. A miracle is what my sin needs. When I'm walking through the Messiah in God's light, guess what I no longer need to be embarrassed by? My sin. My sin, which is embarrassing, okay? It is embarrassing. But I have already publicly acknowledged that my sin is the reason that my Messiah died. The one who brought me into God's light, he died. He bridged the gap that I could not cross. He allowed me to understand the truth and the light. I was no longer bound in chains, in the lies, in the darkness. So the reason we get to walk together fellowshipping in the light because I don't really care if you know about my sin. You shouldn't care if I know about your sin. Because my shame and embarrassment was displayed for the world to see on the cross. 
That was my shame. That's my embarrassment. That's my sin on display. You want to know how bad I am? Look to Jesus on the cross. That's how bad I am. I don't need to hide my sin from you or anybody. It was on display. The whole world saw it. It was nasty. It was ugly. But through that ugliness, guess what? I have forgiveness. And if we're walking together in faith, in the Messiah, guess what we can do? We can have fellowship with each other. Why? Because we are in agreement about the ugliness of our sin. We're in agreement about the beauty of our forgiveness and restoration. Do you see how there really is no middle ground for walking in this? It can't be. Well, I'm forgiven because I want to go to heaven. But that nasty, ugly sin that put Christ on the cross that was displayed as, as rotten as it was for the whole world to see, I still want to hang on to it. It's just so enjoyable. The lie was so nice. It provided so much for me. I, I, I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not done with the lie. I've I got to hang on to the lie. Like that, like that, like what? What are you talking about? Then you didn't. You something's missing in the picture here. You're you're not getting what God's saying. You're missing the point of the light. The point of the light is to show you that the lies were destroying you. Oh. Well, I Oh, that doesn't sound so good anymore. I don't like that. That's the point God's making here, right? Is there's, there's, there's God's light that comes from His truth, and there's nothing even close between His light and the darkness and the lies that He rescued you from. So it says here, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Ready? Well, I never said that I didn't sin. That's not what God's saying. God's saying, if you say, this sin that I'm holding on to over here, not a big deal. Get out of my face. Don't talk to me about my sin. Leave me alone. Let me have my way. I'm going to be fine. He said, I don't have any sin here. Go away, look somewhere else. I'm holding on to it, but just let it go. Let it go. Let me have my sin. We say, I have no sin. Quit looking at it. We are deceiving ourselves. Why? Because I'm saying I want the lie. If I, if I, if I hold on to the sin because it's so valuable for me, I'm saying the lie is more valuable than the truth. But if we confess our sins, by the way, to confess is to agree with. This is not about perfection. This is not about I'll never sin again. No, this is about acknowledging that what God says is truth. If I confess God, you're right. Your truth, your light is right. You are right. My sin is nasty and horrible and wicked and deceptive and it's destroying me and that's what you died for. That's why you're on the cross. That's why I was so nasty and ugly was because of my sin. I agree with you that I reject that that lie is worth holding on to. That's what confessing means. Confessing is to agree with God about what he says about your sin. He doesn't say you're never going to sin again. As a matter of fact, he addresses that in just a minute. Right? But if you agree with God, you confess with him that he is right about your sin, that you demand forgiveness in order to walk in his light. It says he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
God's not looking for you to fix yourself, to come to a place of behaving in his righteousness so that now you're in good standing. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for you to say, your truth is your truth and it's worth believing in and I'm going to agree with your truth even if I, in my agreement, I'm acknowledging I can't attain it. You agree that God's truth is, is truth and it's worth living and it's worth pursuing and it's worth promoting and it's worth loving. Guess what? He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That ugly thing that you keep committing, that, that terrible thing that you keep doing, guess what? If you agree with God about your sin, guess what? He is faithful and just. He will forgive. He will remove the unrighteousness from you. You don't have to do it. God's not waiting for enough penance from you. It is based on His righteousness, not your ability to be sorry enough. But if we say we don't have any sin, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. You see, you, you see, Jesus died. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans. Right? Jesus died, as we read it here in, in, in John 3, just a little bit ago. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. He died because we were evil. If I say my evil is not evil because I want to hold on to it, then how can I say that his word is in me? I reject his truth to hold on to the lie, but I say, oh no, but God and I, we're good. We, we got an understanding. Right? I, I, I prayed, I talked to Jesus. We're good, we're good, everything's fine. Now just, just ignore what you're seeing in my life and don't talk to me about it and leave it alone. You see, you say, I, don't, I don't have any sin. Ignore my sin. We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. But he says here in chapter 2, which is so encouraging, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Okay? God's light is so clear. It is so obvious. When we walk in his light, there's so much peace and joy and contentment and comfort and hope and healing that guess what? I don't want the lie anymore. I don't want to embrace the lie. The lie is not worth it. It was so painful and miserable and disastrous and embarrassing. But the truth is the opposite. And I want the truth. So guess what? I do want to walk in the truth. But if I do sin... Right? So yes, I walk in the truth. I love the truth. I like, I like the truth. I, en- I embrace the truth. But if I do sin, what happens? If I sin, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. By the way, if I said to you, have you ever had an advocate in your life? You'd all have to raise your hands. I'm not talking about Jesus. I just mean another human being. You have had somebody who has gone to bat for you because they wanted to support you. At some point in your life, you have had somebody. Doesn't it feel great to have an advocate? Somebody who's going to go to bat for you and say, hey, I know that. I I know them. They are are trustworthy. They're going to do what they say they're going to do. If someone, someone who's, gonna, who's got your back, someone who's going to support you, and you know that they're not going to turn their back on you. Why? Because they've stuck out their neck for you. Jesus is your advocate before the Father. Maybe you're like me and you still occasionally sin. Maybe. <laughs> let's not talk about how occasionally, okay, I don't want to talk about maybe, maybe any embarrassing point here, okay? But let's just say that occasionally you sin. Daily might be an occasion, you know. <laughs> but anyway, right? And uh, like, God, I don't, I don't understand how you could love me. 
Truly, I don't understand it. I see the results of my choices. I see the results of my sin. And frankly, I'm not lovable. If you, have conf- if you are continually agreeing with God about your sin, he's the one who said he's faithful and just Faithful and just means he's faithful. He's not going to change. Just means he's doing the right thing. He's faithful and he's just. He's doing the right thing to forgive your sins. And he's doing it, why? Because you have an advocate who's standing there next to him saying, this one's mine. They're good. You can depend on them because I've already taken care of their sin. Do you realize that before God, you're not the dependable one? But your advocate is. And he's already taken care of all the problems that you have created. And he says to the Father, that one's with me. He's okay. She's okay. They're, with, they're, they're mine. They're with me. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. He's the legal substitute. Plain and simple. The legal substitute. It's already been done. It's already been taken care of. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. You see, this hope that we have this encouragement, this peace, this life, this light from the Father and from the Son and from the Holy Spirit, guess what? It's not just for us. It's also for the whole world. You know, this hope that you walk in because you know the Lord, guess what? Other people need the same hope. Do you know why you continue in God's truth? It's not just for you only, but it's because other people are trapped in the lies and don't realize that there's any alternative. And my dad has a great quote. He has several, but one of these that's really helped me. He goes, why are we so surprised when unbelievers choose to go against God? Why are we shocked when somebody who has not accepted God's truth as the truth in their life goes against his truth, why is that surprising to us? That's just normal behavior. This is why the light is so powerful and why we must continue in the light. Yes, it's for us and yes, it's for our own benefit because God has done that for us and it's been a, he's been so kind to us. But it's also for the benefit of others who are continuing in the deception and the lies and they don't even know what the light looks like. They have not been exposed to the light. Or maybe they have and they haven't yet said, God, I agree with you about my sin. And so they're still walking in the darkness. I want to close just thinking for a moment about Christ being our advocate before the Father. I'm going to read two passages from Hebrews here. Hebrews 7 says this in verse 22. It says, so Jesus has become a guarantee of a better covenant. Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Permanently. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day, as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered Himself. Hebrews 9 says this in verse 11. But the Messiah has appeared, high priest of the good things that have come, in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, 
that is, not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all by the blood of goats, I'm sorry, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow sprinkling those who are defiled sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from, the, from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus Christ is the mediator of God's new promise through the blood of the Messiah. So you have the promise of an eternal inheritance. Now, wrapping this up and looking ahead to, as we continue in 1 John, we have the beginning, which is a, uh, a testimonial of John's time with the Messiah. And then he expresses the clarity of dis- the distinction and great clarity because between God's truth and the lies that are opposed to it. And, he's, and, he, and he, he finishes that with a clear reminder of our salvation through the blood of the Messiah, the Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who has already made the propitiation for our sins. So we have God's truth and the opposite. We have been redeemed from the opposite to God's truth. And then he goes in to a very challenging teaching, which we will look at next week, which is about keeping God's commands and loving our brother in Christ. So, uh, Lord willing, we will continue looking at this difficult teaching next week. But it's very encouraging this morning that um, God's truth is light and is the opposite of the darkness and the lies that we have been redeemed from. And thank the Lord through the blood of our Messiah, we do not need to bear the shame of the darkness that we once walked in and maybe even occasionally are deceived by. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the power of your truth. May it continue to work in our hearts and lives and change us to be more like Christ. And Lord, as we are going, we're thankful that we do have your forgiveness. Lord, that you, the righteous one, have already made the propitiation and that you are our advocate before the Father. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know the forgiveness that you've offered by, by agreeing with you, confessing with you uh, uh, what you say about sin, Lord, that it is awful and that we do need redemption from it, I pray that you would bring that person to a place of confessing and agreeing with you about their sin, that they might know your forgiveness. And Lord, for those of us who have already agreed with you, may we continue to agree with you about the need for our forgiveness. And Lord, may uh, we just rejoice in your propitiation and advocacy for each one of us. And we ask this in your name. Amen.